I wonder where we are, monsters. The portal cube here must be on the frisk or something. What do you think? I mean, it seems to be working. Uh, well, I guess we can explore around here for a bit. Monsters, do you hear that rumbling in the distance? I wonder what that could be. Oh, look! Monsters, it's the welcoming committee. I guess they're coming to say hello. Then again, they don't look too friendly. What the? Why are you all the way out here? Uh, not sure, it just kinda popped up out of nowhere, I guess. Uh, just a small calculation error I made on this. The portal cube. Where did you get that? We need to go. Alright, uh, sounds like an adventure, monsters. Hey, by the way, what can we call you? Unit 522. Awesome, they call me, uh, yeah man, I don't know if you see that or not, but it's freaking huge! They want that portal cube you're carrying. Stay here. Monsters, so I guess my portal cube is highly wanted by these giant rust buckets. Well, uh, monsters, I guess I'll try to handle this on my own. You ready? Hey, unit, that was some serious ass kicking back there. We need to get somewhere safe. They won't stop until they have what you possess that portal cube. Hey, I have an idea. Why don't we tell some scary stories on the way? Sure. Okay, monsters, let's follow unit number 522 here into wherever the hell. But in the meantime, let's get ready for some creepy tales. Hold on to your pudding and let the stories begin. These fucking kids, man. Up the stairs, down the stairs, day in and day out, 24-7. I live in a large two-story house that was split into four apartments sometimes in the 70s. The house itself is over 130 years old, so the walls are thin and shitty, and you can hear every noise coming from all four apartments. The stairs leading to the two places on top go right above my closet, with the landing above my room. Now, I don't really mind that. The occasional door slam, shower running, people chatting, whatever. You learn to deal with it. These fucking kids though. The older one's a boy, maybe 11, and the girl is no more than 8. And their mother, or her shitty boyfriend, drops them off at their grandparents above me, usually about 6 or 7 in the morning. So of course, thud 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 thud, as they pound up the fucking stairs like a herd of elephants. They never yell or do any other normal kid things. This happens all day. Thud, 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 out of the house, screaming outside my window, throwing things at trees for 20 minutes. Then, thud, 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 back in the house. Their mom doesn't pick them up until late, sometimes not, in, sometimes not until 2 or 3 in the morning, but she's always back as early as the day before. I can't imagine how their poor grandma deals with all this. Being such a sweet old lady and letting me mooch off her Wi-Fi, I didn't want to complain to her and get the kids will be kids answer I expected. So I mostly just fucked with them to relieve my annoyance. Nothing serious. A joke werewolf mask in my window when they went outside. I heard them giggling over it one time. Banging on the underside of my steps as they ran up, <laughs> it became almost a game. For several years, they'd run up the stairs. I would bang around and listen to them shrieking about the monster underneath their grandma, who always laughed over it when she saw me outside. Like I said, nothing serious. It actually became pretty fun, making them scream in gleeful terror like that. It had been about six years since I moved in, and maybe three or four since we started our game. September was coming to a close, and a few friends and I decided to go to Germany to hang out and get shit-faced. Yes, I'm sure we acted like normal shitty tourists, sorry guys, but at least I spoke passable German. 
We stayed out for about two weeks, running around Europe getting drunk. Probably the greatest vacation I have no memory of, although ultimately nothing of note happened. I get home about 10 a.m. park, but before I get the chance to go inside, the mom approaches me. Weird, I've never seen her here this late. Up until this point, I had no contact with her whatsoever, so I wasn't sure what to expect. She was fucking furious with me though. Where the fuck do you get off speaking to my kids like that, you fucking little bitch? She poked her face right into mine, lips snarled and rearing for a fight. I held my hands up and took a step back. Whoa lady, hold up, I've never talked to your kids, I haven't even been here. Stay out of my face until you have your shit straight. I stormed past without waiting for a response, counting to ten, doing all my breathing exercises and trying to keep my temper. I go inside, shower, smoke, watch some Netflix and relax. There's a knock on my door and I close my eyes for a moment, breathe, then get up and check the peephole. I untense, it's just the grandma probably wanting to apologize for her daughter's random bout of insanity. I open the door, smiling, very self-conscious of the fact that my living room smells like weed and this nice old lady can smell it. She's too preoccupied to take note. Have you been out? How long? Did anyone stop by? Her lower lip is trembling in fear. And since the saddest thing in the world has to be an old person crying, I explain as quickly as possible. Yes, I've been gone for two weeks, outside of the country. I live alone and didn't ask anyone to watch the place. She thanks me for clarifying and proceeds to tell me why the mother was so upset. It's also why I'm staying with my friend from the trip, typing this up at their place right now. While I was gone, the kids continued their usual activities, clomping up and down the stairs, trying to figure out why the monster was no longer responding. So while the grandma napped, they investigated. Our other two neighbors, both women older than the grandma, rarely, if ever, left their homes. There was no chance of them paying any attention to this. According to the kids, they sat on the stairs and knocked nicely on the stairs, asking the monster to come back and why did he go away? After a few minutes of this, they got an answer. Here's where the accounts of the kids differ. The boy claims that he heard a nasty growling voice, dropping the f-bomb a bunch and being real mean, saying all kinds of gross stuff. The girl, however, said to have heard a nice voice, asking her to go into the basement of the house so the monster could play with her face to face. Her brother of course stopped her from doing so. How could they possibly have such wildly different experiences? I have no explanation for this. All I know is the grandma was much more shaken after I explained that I didn't let anyone in my apartment if I wasn't there. And I showed her a few pictures I'd been tagged in the day of the incident. While the mom had just put it down to me being a creepy asshole, she changed her tune after her grandma told her everything I said. They called the cops. And we all have our statements. And they recommended I stay with my friend. So here I am. I don't know who or what might have been in my closet. I don't even know how they got in. Nothing was moved or damaged. All the doors and windows were exactly as I'd left them. It's as if they materialized in my closet, spoke to the kids, and disappeared again. I don't know what to make of the situation, or the fact that, climbing the stairs to my friend's apartment, I heard and felt a distinct thumping coming from underneath. I found a box that contained a letter from a serial killer. I went to the mall today to look for engagement rings. My girlfriend and I have been together for a while now, and we've talked about getting married. We're already living together so I figured it's time to make it official. After finding the perfect ring I decided I would treat myself and bought a Starbucks coffee. Near there was a spot with a few benches to sit at, with some tall plants next to each bench. It was in the corner of the mall away from the shops and the crowds of people, the perfect place to sit and prepare myself for the upcoming proposal. 
I knew she would say yes, but that didn't seem to help my nerves at all. A few minutes after sitting there and looking around, I noticed this white wooden lockbox hidden in one of the plants next to me. Curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to check it out. Opening it up, I found a ton of pictures, as well as sheets of notebook paper folded up. The pictures were of normal looking people, all smiling and happy. But no two pictures were of the same person. In fact, they weren't even at the same locations. They almost seemed completely random. I unfolded the paper and it was a handwritten letter that was several pages long. I wanted to read it, but I was too excited about the proposal that I had planned and I stuffed everything back into the box and took it with me as I rushed home to get ready for the evening. After getting home, I cleaned up the house a bit and took a shower. As I was about to start dinner, I got a text message from my girlfriend saying that work was keeping her a little late tonight. That's not uncommon at her job, plus it gave me some extra time to prepare, so it was no big deal. I decided that I would go ahead and read the letter from the box since I had some extra time. Here's what was written in the letter. If you found this letter in a small wooden box with a heart on it, then congratulations. You're probably very curious why it was left hidden and who the people are in the photos. I won't expect you will be very happy with the answer, but I'll give it to you anyway. Before I begin, let me tell you about myself. I need you to understand who I am before I can tell you. I was born in 1986. When I was a kid, I remember being happy until I was 8 years old. My parents went out to celebrate their 10th wedding anniversary but never came home. It was raining and there was a car crash and both of them died that night. That was torture for an 8 year old. I ended up moving to go live with my aunt and uncle in Cleveland. I was never the happiest after that, but I tried. My aunt tried to be there for me but my uncle would just get upset and yell because I never smiled or acted like a normal kid. He would yell at me and tell me that I was ruining their marriage and he wished that I died alongside my parents. He eventually started drinking and they would fight even more. My aunt always rushed me to my room so I wouldn't see it, but I could still hear it. He would hit her a lot. Over the next year, his drinking got even worse and so did their fighting. One night he came home drunk, yelling about how much he hated me and then he slapped me. I was shocked. My aunt shoved him down and then told me to go to my room. This was the worst fight I heard by far. They both were screaming and then she was crying. I could hear him start hitting her. Then she got quiet. I cried myself to sleep. I never did see my aunt again after that. The next day, my uncle told me that she had left and said that she was never coming back. It wasn't until years later I knew the truth. After that, things got better with my uncle. He stopped drinking and started being nice to me. He even apologized for all the things he had said and done. We started hanging out and doing things together. We would go to baseball games and he would even help me out with my homework and I even learned how to do my hair so it could get me dressed for school. I was starting to think I could actually feel happy again. When I was 11 years old, we were sitting in the living room watching the last game of the World Series. I'll never forget that game. It was tied in the 11th inning. Then Florida hit a line drive, sending a guy home to win the game. Cleveland had lost. My uncle started screaming and yelling slurs. I hadn't seen him that angry in years. He quietly looked at me and then stormed out of the door and drove off without saying a word. He didn't return home until late that night. When he did, he walked in, opened my door, and stood there in the dark without saying a word. I didn't say anything either. I was too scared. Even from across the room, there was a strong odor of booze, an odor I remembered all too well. That was the first night it happened. He began drinking again. He never hit me, not like he did my aunt anyway. This went on until I was about 15 years old and I just snapped. I didn't feel the same. I felt stronger, like I could take on the world. I wasn't scared of anything anymore. There was also a level of apathy that was, is, just unexplainable. That night, when he came into my bedroom, I gave him everything he wanted. To be completely honest, I even enjoyed it that time. 
It was like I was in control for the first time. After we were done, and he drunkenly stumbled back into his bedroom, I walked to the shed and grabbed an axe. I opened his door and stood in the doorway. He opened his eyes and made a quick remark about me coming for seconds. He then sat up and turned his light on. He saw the axe and he knew what I was there for. He yelled at me that he was going to kill me, just like he did my aunt. I then started hacking him with the axe. That was my first time. After that was over, I had some strange emotions. I was laughing and happy, but not just because he was gone. It was something else. I enjoyed it. The feeling of when the axe hit into his body, his blood flying everywhere, the screams of agony, the look of defeat in his eyes. I enjoyed the feeling of control, of having control over someone's life and death. So you wanted to know who the people in the photos are. They are all the people I had control over. People who I killed so I could get that feeling once more. Why would I leave the box hidden? Well, that's how I choose. Whoever finds the box is the next to die. Then I start all over. I'm freaking out right now. This can't be real, right? This has to be some kid screwing with people. Surely I would have heard about this. It would be in the news, right? I just heard someone walking around downstairs. It's probably my girlfriend, but my nerves are rattled. I'm going to go down there to check things out. I'll update once I know it's her. Update. Hey guys. So this is the author's girlfriend. I guess his would-be fiancé. I really wasn't expecting this. I found this page open on our computer. I'm not sure what I'm doing or why I'm posting this, but I figured I would share what happened. I'm still shaking. I'm sorry if this is a bit incoherent. Last night when coming home, I turned the corner onto our street and saw tons of police lights. I parked the car as close as I could and ran towards the house where I was stopped by an officer who wouldn't let me in. Before telling me anything, they asked me tons of questions. They asked me where I was, why I stayed late from work, if he and I had any problems, etc. They knew we didn't once they found the ring and the sheet of paper where he was scribbling down his proposal ideas. That's when they let me go and told me what happened and I'm having a hard time with it. I loved him so much. They told me that someone came into our home and repeatedly hit him with an axe. There was blood everywhere. He has wounds in his arms where he tried to block it, but eventually couldn't stop the blows. Photo albums were spread everywhere. A picture from a photo booth on our first date was missing. The police wouldn't let me in last night. I was able to convince them to let me into our bedroom to get some clothes, which is where I am now. I saw this open and I thought I would share the update. I have to go now. I'm really having a hard time with this. Why did he have to find this stupid box? I loved him. He was good to me. He was nothing like my uncle. When I was younger, I always had an interest in anything scary. My mother always told me it was unhealthy and now I wish I had paid more attention to her. I don't know if the nightmare began due to my interest or my interest developed because of my nightmares. Either way, I'm ruined. I can never sleep well, always waking up to pure terror or because of my own screaming. Even though the dreams were scary in the moment, they never really stuck with me. That is until about a week ago, when I moved and everything got worse. This is where my story really begins. My mom had just moved away, so I was living with my dad until the end of the school year, when I would return to my mom. My dad and brother both worked long hours, leaving before I woke up and getting home long after I returned from school. I had a room upstairs, across from my brother, Nate. There were three windows in my room, two visible from my bed, 
Occasionally I would wake up and feel something watching me and it always seemed to come from the window facing my bed. I always tried to avoid looking that way at night as the window had no curtains and I imagined seeing someone standing outside on the roof. Soon after I moved in, I began hearing tapping noises on the window. Not every night, but often enough for it to become normal to me. I won't lie, it scared me a little, but I spent too much time home alone to let it bother me. One night, I went to bed early and thought I would actually be able to sleep peacefully. I couldn't have been more wrong. That night, I had the scariest, most vivid dream of my life. I don't even remember what happened in the dream other than seeing this monster. It was in the shape of a person, but it had no skin, almost as if it had been burnt off. All the muscles and blood were visible, so the overall body was orange and red. It had eyes that were pure black, no mouth, and only a little bump for a nose. It was always crouching and swaying as if ready to run at any given time. It never blinked and it just stared at me the whole time, only inches from my face. I woke up terrified to say the least. I knew I'd never seen anything like this in movies, so it bothered me how I was able to see it so clearly. I was home alone and decided to reach out to my best friend, Lana. Lana and I had been friends since 7th grade and at this point, we were juniors in high school. We had done everything together, such as vacationing with her family out of the state and missing a week of school to go to Disney World together. But then, Lana and I started going to school, two hours apart. We talked all day, every day, yet we still miss seeing each other. I used to look back at the pictures from our trips. We were so happy together. So, back to the morning of the dream. I texted Lana and told her all about it. She always understood me, and this time was no exception. I felt bad, and still feel bad to this day for scaring her so badly. Sometimes I think that if I never told her, things would have ended differently. Nonetheless, she comforted me and assured me that I would feel better soon. I knew she was right, so I pulled myself together and got ready for school. It was the last Friday before spring break, so of course the day dragged on and on. All day I had this feeling that something was off, like I was being watched. I was at school, so there were tons of people around, yet I knew this feeling was different. I made it through the day uneventfully, and then went to my mom's that evening to spend spring break with her. My mom is a nurse and has treated a variety of patients, some with physical ailments and others mental. I tried to explain my dream to her to see if this was common. Of course, she knew my history with an interest in anything scary. She didn't want to hear anything about my dream and dismissed it saying I watched too many movies. Maybe she was right, but that didn't change how scared I was. The first night, I think I slept for two hours at the most. My memories from that night are still a little blurry. I can't exactly separate dreams from reality that night, so maybe this happened in real life, or maybe I dreamt it. Either way, I know what I saw. I saw the skinless thing crouch down beside my bed, staring at me again. I remember opening my eyes and it jumped as if not expecting me to wake up anytime soon. I don't know what happened after this. Maybe I fell back asleep or my dream ended. I woke up, fully alert this time and saw that it was only 4 a.m. I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep again, so I texted Lana and told her what had happened. Of course, she was asleep, so her reply came hours later. She was just as scared and hadn't been able to stop thinking about the monster since I first told her about it. I felt so awful for scaring her like that. That day, I could barely function. My fear had almost paralyzed me. I knew talking to my mom would be no help, so I dealt with it on my own. By that I mean never leaving my room, in fear that the skinless thing would be outside waiting for me. This could only go on for so long. I went there to see my mom after all. Later that day, we went to the movies together. 
and then she went to bed right when we got back home. I knew sleep wasn't an option for me, so I went into my room to watch Netflix for a while until I got hungry and decided to go into the kitchen. It's a short walk from my room to the kitchen, but I walked past the window facing her backyard. My mom left the back light on, and as I walked past the window, I tried not to look, but the light made that difficult. I looked outside for only a second, but I saw it. The skinless thing wasn't just in my dreams, it was just outside crouching by the stairs leading to the back door. I was already past the window when these thoughts registered. I immediately went back to look out again, but nothing was there. I went back to my room and felt completely empty. I felt like I was going crazy or living in some awkwardly written horror story. Needless to say, I didn't sleep at all that night. My mom had woke up around 8 the next morning and was surprised to see I was already awake. Once again, I tried telling her about the nightmares and how I saw the monster the night before. She dismissed it yet again, so I text the whole story to Lana. I asked her if she wanted to come over, to which she said yes. When Lana got to my house, I felt a lot better. I always felt better when she was around. We spent a few days at my mom's with no sightings of this skinless thing. We talked about it non-stop and I still wonder who was more scared. It seemed like we both saw exactly the same thing, but she was always better at putting her thoughts into words. She described it as looking like the diagrams in anatomy books, which was eerily accurate. We went back to my dad's house together on the Wednesday of that week. My dad and Nate both went to bed early, so Lana and I were left to find something to do. Neither of us wanted to wake up my family, so we decided to sit on the roof outside of my bedroom window. This is where I always heard the tapping coming from, so I took this chance to see if there were any animal footprints on the roof. I found nothing but a few smudges on the window along with a small crack. It looked as if someone had taken a knife and was slowly scraping away the glass. Lana said maybe it was the skinless thing trying to break into my room. She thought that was funny, but I, I did not appreciate it as much. We were on the roof for about an hour and just talking and listening to music together. It seemed to get darker as the night went on. All the stars disappeared as if something had scared them away. The only light outside came from a lamp in my room, not even bright enough to illuminate Lana and I right outside the window. I was always afraid of the dark, but for some reason I found that night to be peaceful, probably because Lana was there with me. I wish that night could have lasted a little longer. At about 2 a.m., Lana and I heard a rustling sound and then a dull thump. I had three dogs, so we both tried to believe it was one of them moving around. A few minutes later, I asked Lana if she felt strange. She instantly said yes, but she didn't want to scare me by saying she felt like we were being watched. Too late for not scaring me, I had that exact same feeling. We both looked towards the end of the roof where no light was shining. We tried to dismiss our fears saying we were just paranoid. We tried to lighten the mood by laughing it off and sending pictures to each other on Snapchat. Within the next few minutes, I lost a part of me. It's a bit of a blur, but I know what happened. I turned on my camera's flash and took a picture of Lana. The flash stunned both of us a bit, so it took a minute for our eyes to adjust to my phone screen. We looked at the picture at the same time and there it was, the skinless thing, just a few feet behind Lana, crouching as if ready to attack her. We looked at my phone for maybe five seconds, then I heard Lana screaming, I felt myself falling, then heard a sickening crunch, it was all black after that. I woke up in the hospital with a broken arm and a minor concussion. According to the doctors, I had fallen off my roof. I had immediately asked where Lana was, only to receive confused looks. I asked again, becoming frustrated, 
Lana had been to my house countless times, gone on vacation with me, and met my entire family. Yet they claimed they had no idea who I was talking about. My world began falling apart in that moment. I became hysterical, accusing everyone of lying to me. I was sent to a psychologist where I was diagnosed with severe schizophrenia. The doctor told me there was no Lana and I had made her up. I couldn't believe anyone around me. I just wanted to go home. How can I simply make up a person, let alone my best friend? As soon as I got home, I went directly to the vacation photos with Lana. It was only my family and I. This couldn't be happening. I knew Lana went with us. I had looked at those pictures hundreds of times. I couldn't handle it anymore. I went to my room and slept for the rest of the day. I woke in the middle of the night with a sudden realization. The picture I took on the night of the attack. I checked my phone and sure enough, the picture was there. Lana was sitting right there on my roof, exactly the way I imagined her, along with the skinless thing. Lana, I'm so sorry. I know you're real and I know I'll see you again. I'm going out on the roof now and I'm waiting for the monster. It will bring us back together soon. Uh, how much longer do we have to walk? Oh, hi, monsters. Yeah, Unit 522 and I are still traveling. But I think we're getting ready to come up on a crossroads. Which way should we go, left or right? Monsters, let us know in the comments below. And monsters, very important, make sure to leave a like. Because the more likes we get, the more powerful we all become to be able to destroy this meteor that's heading right for us. It might hit us in the next five seconds, so be sure to hit that like button. And also, big shouts to Unit number 522. Thanks a lot man for collaborating on this video as well as kicking some robot ass back there you really saved this monster's butt and monsters big shouts to all of you and I really hope you enjoy the video if you are new to yet man TV be sure to hit that subscribe button and become a monster today again monsters thank you guys unit 522 thank you man and like always till next time where are you going the party's just begun when I started Grammar school.